Hey, good morning, Eastern Oregon, and welcome to this April 18th version of AM Live on EOA, your connection to Eastern Oregon, and we're on the EOA network. Here in a bit, we're going to have Elgin Mayor James Johnson and Elgin City Manager Alex McCadden with us. Back-to-back -back days with double guests. Back-to-back -back days with double and guests. And it's first yeah. Friday. <laughs> yeah. It's already April 18th. May, June, we have three months until doomsday. Three months, yeah. yeah. We have. Can you believe it's only, it's only three, May, June, July, yeah, three months and Til trying? nine days, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, it's coming. Yeah. It, yeah, it, my, my thing is like it's, uh, yeah, it's one month, May 21st until the primaries. So, like, everything is flowing in that way. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, uh, uh, um, Shrine Game makes us a lot more money than your May yes, 21st it, thing. Yes, yeah. Kind of, <laughs> it, the, the, the meter kind of goes yeah. the opposite direction. <laughs> yeah. So. That it, it Really, it's not only a month project, I would say, for me. Yeah. Well, maybe a little more. I start working on stuff. I'll really start working on stuff in June. Well, and I think we, you know, I, Tanya asked me this. Every time, you know, it's like, is there a bunch of equipment that we need to buy? Because, you know, we've had to, every year we've had to, and I think we're, I mean, there might be some, but the for the most part we've built, I mean, we spent a lot of time building the system, you know. People that, people don't know that, but our control room for this studio is kind of all in cases. And so then when we have a big event like uh, the, like, shrine then those cases you know technically we just kind of wrap it up and we move it into the trailer and it's a little more complicated than that but that's every year it gets a little easier too because we have you know stuff in place yeah yeah we know exactly how things are going to go and well and that's why you know like I, I mean like those big the people that all they do is just travel and do events you know or football games particularly if you're doing the same event over and over and over again then the crew knows exactly what to do and you know i think the most important thing for me is the relationships are, are established so like contacts yeah. Yeah. the stuff with the cheerleaders the yeah. stuff with the coaches the stuff with the you know what i mean it just yeah. it makes it the first year i just went into it blind you know what i mean i knew a few of the people but now yeah. it's like i know exactly who to call for what and if if there's something that needs to happen it's it's much easier than it was the first year sure. yeah well and that's kind of you're you're involved in that end of it all of that prep stuff and i'm involved on the other side of like making sure that the day happens and so the tech the, the tech. tech yeah the tech i stay away from the tech part as much as possible because it stresses me out it yeah. makes me anxious so i just stay away until it's time to wait like if, there, <laughs> if I have to be there to do something, I'll do it. But yeah. outside of that, all those chords and ooh, no. Yeah. Nope. <laughs> I don't even <laughs> like looking in that van, <laughs> in the in the trailer. Yeah. Yeah. All right. Well, hey, you want to do, do sports? Let's do it. And sports report brought to you by Hobby Habit right here in town. Go check them out. Four Eleven First Street. They have a great selection of, I mean, everything from the Traxxas RC cars, Magic the Gathering cards, board games, STEM products for your kids. It's awesome. Uh, hobby habit, just for the fun of it. LeGrand Softball hosts Pendleton tomorrow at 2 and 4. Those are big GOL games. LeGrand Softball is undefeated, and, and they're looking to stay that way against their newly made GOL rival. Um, it's cool, the... the one of the pitchers for EOU is a Pendleton girl. So a couple of weeks ago when they played C of I, we got to see a LeGrand girl pitching for C of I and a Pendleton girl pitching for EOU, and that was kind of cool. The baseball team also plays Pendleton tomorrow at 2-4, and four, and they're coming off of a couple wins in college place, and they split their GOL opener with Baker a couple of weeks ago. So... I mean, I'm, I, I haven't given up hope on the baseball team. I think they're six and six or five and six, and they're 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 going to compete. I mean, they split with Baker. We'll see what they do against Pendleton, and we'll see who comes out on top on the G, in the GOL. 
Rankings are out for EOU track and field. The women come in at number 25 in the nation, while the men come in at 16th today and tomorrow. CCC championships for the decathlon and the heptathlon right here up at EOU at Banner Bank Track. Uh, go check it out. EOU is also having the EOU invite run concurrently with that. So you'll not only get the uh, multi-championships, but you'll also get to see just a regular old uh, college track meet today and tomorrow up there. Um, EOU baseball plays Central Washington this Saturday. It's on the road. It's a doubleheader. It's a non-conference uh, couple of games, so it's not going to affect EOU's, the baseball team is not going to make the playoffs. So, I mean, it, it, this these are non-conference games anyways. But, man, what a year. Like, this is their this, – the, this baseball team turned around big time this year. And it's been really impressive to see what uh, Coach Treadway has done with these guys and just the kind of guys that he's bringing in, the recruitment. The it, It's just the culture has changed definitely, definitely. EOU softball team moved up four spots this week from number 15 to number 11. I still think that they are underranked. Um, you have two teams in the top 10 that EOU has beaten, including conference rival OIT. EOU beat them two out of three, including a 10 to nothing win. And then they also beat Jessup, who's in the top 10. And they have a better record than both of them. So that's just kind of how, how it goes. I mean, the the we've talked about the rankings numerous times on here. I'll, I'll take the four spots. We don't want to be ranked too high going in anyways. We really just want home playoff game in the first round. That's that's the big thing. E-O, oh, they play uh, Bushnell this weekend at home. Uh, Friday, Saturday, with Saturday being senior day, as it's their last home games of the season for this EOU softball team, ranked number 11 in the country. Kaylee Hoskins is number two in the country in ERA. She's number one in strikeouts per seven. She's second in strikeouts overall. She's looking to win CCC uh, and National Pitcher of the Year, and I think it's highly likely right now. It's, it's kind of cool. EOU women's lacrosse travels to Corbin on Saturday for a one o'clock game against the Warriors. Um, so recently I said a comment about the lacrosse team and, you know, like possibly replacing lacrosse with another sport because of how they've, you know, done. And, um, I, I have to be more careful about what I say when it comes to stuff like that. Cause I do have a little bit of influence, maybe a little, and, and, um, I want all EOU sports to succeed. I don't want to, I don't want lacrosse to necessarily go away, um, I, I, I didn't realize how much that those kind of comments can affect that. So once again, sorry for, you know, saying you know, that EOU lacrosse is replaceable. It's not. They're working hard. The coach is working hard. The players are working hard. And that's what matters the most. AM Sports Report brought to you by Hobby Habit. 411 First Street in the ground. I almost choked that one out <laughs> just for the fun of it. All right. Good stuff. Yeah. Let's take a look outside. There's hopes of a beautiful day out there, isn't that? Yes, gorgeous? there is. Bud yeah. said we need some young roadies to set up and break down. We do, we have that, bud. We're good. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, we got uh, 60, however many year old young uh, Lee Wright in there cranking it out. Yeah, yeah. Our our problem, bud, is is that. You know, we don't, I don't have it, I don't have the equipment such that everybody can just, anybody can just plug it in. So that's, that's on me. So let's look at the graphic. So 56 today, 28 tonight. So Back into freezing. Today. Yeah, it's getting a little, little chilly. Yeah, and then, and so it's going to be near freezing for the rest of the week. Uh, but looks like it's going to be nice. Uh, coming into the weekend and then maybe nicer in in the next next week so i'm, I'm good with that yeah all Just right let's do weather. i want to do one of our sponsors uh valley insurance here in Legrand. i'm throwing this at gabe <laughs> valley insurance here in Legrand. they're at uh 1215 adams avenue in downtown Legrand. i uh, really want to thank them for what they do and supporting eo alive uh, TV and our AM show. Uh, 
be sure and go in and take a look at, they've recently remodeled. They were in the old Umqua Bank building downtown and they have uh, remodeled that store and looks great. They do a home auto business and life. They're an independent insurance agent. And so the advantage of that is that they can find different companies that can give you insurance. So they have a lot of different choices. And so they can find something that's the right fit for you. Again, Valley Insurance, downtown La Grande, one of our great sponsors. Okay, so here in just a minute, we are going to have with us uh, James Johnson, the mayor of Elgin, and Alex McCadded, the new city manager of Elgin. We'll be right back in just a minute. Here in Eastern Oregon, we're blessed to live in such a wonderful area. And though it may seem mild-mannered, there's actually quite a lot that goes on in this area. And apparently, there's two dinguses who happen to be here that are actually crazy enough to get up at the crack of dawn to talk about it. Tune in to AM Live on EOA with Brent and Dodzy, featuring special guests, weather, sports, news, and more, every Tuesday and Thursday at 8 a.m., only on EOA Live, your connection to Eastern Oregon, now on Roku. Okay, so it's live. <laughs> All right, we're back right here with James Johnson, Elgin Mayor, Alex McCadden, new city manager, Elgin. So, and you, you guys might, James has been on the show before. Yeah, glad that you, yeah, yeah, glad that you're here with us. And Alex has been working with us on and off for a number of years. Started actually when you were in college, right? Yeah, I think I came on to do something or other back then. Yeah, and then, and then you moved over to the west side. You were city manager for, well, I don't know. Why don't I let you tell that story? Soda right? Pop Springs or yeah. something? Soda Pop Springs. <laughs> yeah, I love that. I was the city manager of Sodaville in uh, Linn County. It's right next to Lebanon, and I did that for the last two years. And uh, every single day, I wanted to come back here. Every Tuesday and Thursday, I watched AM Live on EOA, like <laughs> clockwork. like, oh, I just needed that fix of home. But, yeah. hey, I finally made it back well, cool. Well, glad that you guys are here and we can kind of catch up on the happenings. James, why don't you tell us what's what's happening in Elgin? What's new in Elgin? Well, so we got uh, a big announcement we wanted to bring up. Um, June uh, 15th is our Riverfest and there's going to be several things happening there. One of the things we'll let Alex touch base on is the ribbon cutting for the uh, Real pocket close. park. Yeah. Um, do you want to say anything about that or? Oh, yeah. I mean, the Grand Run River is a very beautiful place, yeah. uh, and it'd be nice to have more of a place to hike alongside it, I think a number of people have thought for a while. And uh, the Joseph Branch Trail is something that's going to be uh, doing just that. There's a, going to be a walking trail between the railroad and the river that'll go from Elgin all the way to Joseph when it's complete. But the, uh, the ribbon cutting for the first piece of that is going to be June 15th uh, during Riverfest. And wow. There's going to start at a little pocket park in the city of Elgin. So where does, yeah, so tell me, I mean, can you describe me where that, where that pocket park is going to be? So it's right next to the train depot. It's okay. already uh, been underway. Um, and one of the awesome things there is the, uh, the Elgin High School um, wood shop teacher, Matt Adams, got involved and they built a, a beautiful gazebo they're putting up there. Nice. Um, so it's really been a great community project, something just really awesome for Elgin. Get out there and take a look at it. And so then the hope is that there's going to be a trail alongside the railroad. Is that what? Yeah, kind of between the railroad and the river. Okay, which is amazing. Yeah. I mean that, and and the goal is that eventually that trail would go all the way to Joseph. To Joseph. Yeah. Yeah. Wow. Yeah, if you just Google the Joseph Branch Trail, that'll be. Yeah, it's going to be amazing. <laughs> is it available just for walking, or can you ride horses on? You it? can ride horses and you can no ride way. bikes, but not no e-bikes. But nothing, not motor nothing motorized. Nothing yeah. motorized. Okay. Makes yeah. sense. Good. Yeah. So yeah. it's going to be awesome, uh, especially if you're a fisherman. Could you imagine the access to yeah. this down that trail the whole way along the river? So are electric bikes motorized? Yes. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> so that, yeah, no I mean, motorized. Yeah. Not, not yet. They, I guess they've talked about that, but um, it hasn't went either direction really. They're just not allowed at the moment. So how does? I mean, who is involved in making that agreement happen when it's in two different counties and, yeah. Well, there is a nonprofit that was created specifically to just get this project, create it and see it through fruition and I believe maintain it over time once it's complete. 
Okay. What about access? Like, it, how many access points are there going to be along the way? Because obviously, you aren't going to walk that whole thing. Yeah. There's got to be places to get off. Yeah, for looking at the map, and the map is available online, there are going to be a number of access points in the cities along the way, and uh, a number of like state parks and things that are along the way. You'll be able to pop into one of those and get on the trail and walk for a while. Is there camping? Is there like camping along the way? So would you be able to like walk so, some one day, camp, walk some more? I don't think you'd be able to like camp on the trail proper. I would have to ask them specifically, okay. but it, it does line up so that you're going to hit a number of camping spots that are already right. along the river. Oh yeah. Perfect. So you don't need to create your own. It's already there. <laughs> right. So home. like, like there's a camping, the railroad runs right by Minam campground, right? I think it, I believe so. Yeah. yeah. Um, so yeah, and no, that would be, that would be amazing. Oh yeah. Yeah. Is it, it's not following the railroad though, right? It's following the river. Yeah. I, if you look at the map for a yeah. significant portion, it's going to be between the railroad and the river. Eventually, you know, like it goes all the way to Joseph. So obviously the Grand Run River doesn't go all right. that way and the railroad doesn't go all the way, but the kind of where it starts in Elgin is going to be that getting you between the river and the railroad and then mm -hmm. eventually, um, you know, it'll, it'll be whatever landforms are in Willowa County, that kind of thing. But the the goal is to get a walking trail all the way from Elgin to Joseph, and this is the first part of it. Yeah. Well, nice. and it and it starts with a start. You know, yeah. you gotta. Yeah. I mean, so a lot of these kind of things they just start, and so. Yeah. And then you kind of figure out. Yeah. Is there a website where people can see that map? Do you know it off the top of your head? Um, not off the top of my head. If you just Google the Joseph Branch Trail. Um, yeah, you'll be able to find all that information there. They have yeah, good, they've got videos and maps stuff, and all yeah. sorts of, and Our, a donate button, you know. And yeah, 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 if anybody's feeling generous, we can. Yeah. Joseph Branch great. Community Tra Trail? Yeah. Yeah. All right, what else is going on? So on that day also, on, on June 15th, uh, Green River Fest, the, the car show there, the Elgin Lions put that on and everything, so come out for that. Um, but as well as uh, we're going to plan a meet and greet um, meet Alex, the new city administrator here, and uh, I'll be there myself too to meet and greet people as well. So we'll announce uh, location and time for that day, but we wanted to get it out there that it is going to be June 15th. Yeah. All right. And that's an opportunity for them to get to know you. Yeah, absolutely. And then ask you tough questions. Yeah, things that I you yeah. know, know everything about. So <laughs> looking forward to that. <laughs> yeah. So I was I was out in one of the Elgin City Council meetings the other day, and that yeah. was the very first time that I had been in those council chambers and stuff. And no, that's a, I mean, we just talked about, but tell how that building happened. I mean, because that's a super cool building. I mean, most towns, their city hall is like ragged, run down, barely standing. Yeah. So. Yeah, I, I wasn't involved with the purchase part of that uh, building, but I will say that uh, WC Construction built that building. Uh, mm -hmm. They were a construction company that had retired, mm -hmm. so it worked out perfect for everybody involved. You know, yeah. they sold that to the to the city. City bought it, and it was uh, a great location for the city. So it's really awesome, beautiful building. Well, and it's and it's right next to Grand Ronde Hospital's clinic right there, and yeah. so I mean, what what really nice buildings right and right across the street from. The Elgin Stampede Grounds, yeah. you know, and yeah, a really nice entrance into Elgin. Great location. Yeah. Yeah. So anything else new that you guys can go on, Alex? So I want yeah. you to talk about, talk about your job and how you got here and so on and so forth. Oh, boy. Well, <laughs> I can offer a couple updates first just to make yeah, sure we're, okay. we're letting the people know what's going on. We do need volunteers, always volunteers in the city. Um, we need, uh, we're trying to get our public safety committee up and running. Um, that probably needs like seven people on it. We've got a counselor, and so we need to find six more people. So if, uh, you know, maintaining public safety and building a public safety plan is of interest to you, uh, let me know. Um, we need members for our budget committee. Our budget committee is going to start meeting in May uh, so that we can get the financial plan for the city ready. And then we need a new city councilor. One of our city councilors just resigned. Um, I believe their, their term is up at like the end of the year. And... Uh, they're going to be out of town basically for most of that, they said, and they don't want to zoom in because they're just like, eh, it's, it's a little too much. So um, their goal is to step aside and let somebody who can actually be there in person participate. Yeah. So if you want to be on the Elgin City Council, 
Let us know again. And uh, we could always use help down at the library too. Oh they're, yeah. They're looking for members as well. Yeah. For their board and, and a, a summer reading program volunteers are looking for those as well. Yeah. So anybody want to read to kids and stuff, go on down and uh, see the librarian. So. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. So Elgin City Administrator. So Elgin's got the council manager form of government. Just about. There's only, I don't know, maybe two cities in Oregon that don't have the council manager system. Uh, I think uh, it's Portland and actually, oddly enough. So council manager. Council that manager. Yeah. So that means that there's an elected city council that is in charge of adopting policy and the budget and telling staff what to do. But then the day-to-day -day functions are handled by the city administrator. Okay. Um, and it's, it's pretty common in the Western United States, especially. Um, there's a lot more council manager government that happen. Um, Actually, I think Union, their charter technically has a mayor council system where the charter says the mayor is the chief executive of the city government and in charge, but they have had an administrator running the show for quite some time, okay. despite what their charter says. So, um, okay. yeah, other than those three, Portland, Union, and Waterloo, every other city government is by uh, charter a council manager system. So okay. It's my job to be in there every day and make sure everything's running smoothly according to the will of the council. So what... what what possessed you to want to be a city manager? How did you, I mean, I know that, Oh yeah. I know from what, I I mean, you've always been a political hawk. Yeah. And I mean, you've just followed politics closely and so on and so forth. You know, when I was a, a kid, I really loved uh, reading history. I was like, I want to, I want to be involved in historical things. And, um, you know, of course you kid, you're like, well, I want to be president someday. Right. Yeah. So I, I just made myself, I, I tried to be keenly aware of political things that were going on. In uh, community college, I was elected to be the uh, student member of the uh, community college's board of trustees. Um, I had to represent a student body of 26,000 students. Um, and as I got in there, thinking like, oh, this is just going to be the first step of my political journey all the way upward, <laughs> um, I was like, oh, this, this local government stuff is actually very, very fun because um, it ends up being kind of the nexus of a lot of things um, That's at the where state. It's at. Exactly, yeah. That's where it's at. The state, you deal with state issues. The federal, you deal with federal issues. But the local government, you deal with you you deal with so many things that happen locally. You usually see a difference being made. You can get water running, and you can get potholes filled, and you can get you know traffic going the way it's supposed to go. Um, you get to really see a vision come to life without you know having to make a federal case out of it. <laughs> Literally, and, federal uh, case. We are. That reminds me. The yes. potholes. We're going to be starting that up in May, so I know that's important to the citizens of Elgin. So, getting some roads cleaned up in May, and uh, Public Works is on top of that, so it's going to be great. Yeah, yeah, I believe May is our, our annual pothole filling yeah. filling yeah. time of the month. So, like I said, you know, it's it's a project where you go, okay, there's a pothole, here's how you fill it, let's go fill it, done. Yeah, like, you don't have to spend years and years toiling with members of you know you know 400 congressmen dealing with like, but no, seven yeah. city councilors. And hey, we need to vote to fill a pothole. Great. Here's they'll vote for the money, and then we get the Spend supplies it, and we do it. Pothole, yeah. yeah. Yeah, get it done. Yeah, and I noticed. I mean, when I went to the Cove City Council meeting, so then it sounds like smaller. The, the one thing that they hire, regardless of the size, is their public works dude, the yeah. guy who fills the potholes. I yeah. presume, right? Yeah. Or, I mean, that is that kind of the. In smaller towns, is that the one? Is that the hired position always? I mean, it makes sense. But. Um, usually, you'll have at least um, a manager and um, you know a public works person. You know, yeah. It's like that in in uh, Sodaville. You know, we had me and we had a public works director. Yeah. Um, or even at the the translator district, you know, there was the manager who was me, yeah. and then we had an engineer. Um, he was he was contracted, but still he was the person that was hired to maintain the actual infrastructure yeah. while I took care of the paperwork side. Yeah. So. Okay, so then you you, so then you decided to become the manager at Sodaville. Yeah. Now, so, and I know that you've always kind of had an interest in state politics and what was going on. Oh yeah. How was that being on the west side and? Oof. Yeah. <laughs> uh, yeah. Having, I mean, the access that I think that you had kind of wanted, yeah. you certainly had the opportunity to. Well, you know, even when I was living here, I would go to Salem frequently right, to uh, yeah. to do stuff over there. But the thing about um, Oregon state politics is it's a very rigid and odd calendar. The legislature meets for five months in odd years and one month in even years. 
So even when you're over there in person, it's still just there for five months and odd years, and one month for even years, then everybody goes home. Okay. Um, so it was nice to be able to pop over, and I did work for our state representative, Bobby Levy, for uh, two sessions in uh, 2023, and then this year. Um, I worked for her again, serving the, the community in Northeast Oregon. Even while I was over there, I, I made sure that you know, I was on the phone with all your local elected officials all the time talking about uh, just projects that are going on in Union County. And so what. this is an even year, so it was a one-month session? One-month session, okay, yeah. Got it. All so, right. you know, Matt Scarfo would come and we'd talk about you know, funding for the fair and that kind of thing. Okay. So. And then in the, uh, and one more time, in the odd year? The odd year, it means for five months. Five months? Five months. Okay. All yeah. Right. And that's where they pass the two-year budget and that kind of thing. Yeah. Take care of the real, real big issues because they've got time to do it. Right. Um, in the one-month session, you're only supposed to do like technical fixes and budget adjustments, but that's kind of turned into a, a whole thing where they, they save the big things they really want to do and just kind of sneak it under the radar and then do it in that small one. So how was, I mean, how was soaking in that political atmosphere? Was there a point? I mean, you said you were really. <laughs> you were interested in getting back over to the east side. Yeah, I mean, it, was, it was still interesting. I mean, there were a couple things that happened right after I moved to Sodaville. Um, at the, because I was moving over there, there was an opportunity. There was a vacancy in the office of uh, the, the state treasurer of the Oregon Republican Party resigned. And I was like, huh, I could do that. That'd be fun while I'm over there since it's going to be easier to do it. And I went to one executive committee meeting and went, I don't want to do this. These people all hate each other. <laughs> <I don't. laughs> it was just a screaming match for two hours. And I was like, I don't, I don't need to do this. So I withdrew, uh, but I was elected anyway. So I um, had to do that for about a year and a half. Um, and that, that got really interesting. We had to raise a lot of money, and we raised unprecedented amounts of money. And we used that to uh, you know, break the Democratic supermajorities in Salem and uh, get a second Republican elected to Congress from Oregon for the first time since like the 1990s. Huh. So um, being in that, that real, real big part of state politics was very interesting for a year and I made a, a lot of friends and relationships that I think you know, were really valuable for, for my work in Sodaville as a civil servant and can be really valuable over here. Those connections are still there and I can go to Salem and make really good friends and use those to uh, make life better for Elgin and Union County overall. Cool. Um, yeah. And then working in the Capitol itself was, again, a slug. Um, the, the partisan environment over there is, like, really, really bitter, like, insanely. You know, we talk about divisions between Republicans and Democrats. I think in a lot of local communities, especially, like, here, you're lay Democrat, you're lay Republican. You're just like, you know, I'm a person. I believe what I believe, but you believe what you believe. People don't, like, go, ah, they're a Democrat. I don't like them. I'm going to make their life miserable. They do so that like in Salem. Yeah. Yeah. So the, huh. wow. yeah. You know, like, um, you know, Steve Clements, who was our, our mayor of LeGrand, was a Democrat. You know, he wouldn't look at Councillor David Glaive, who was a Republican, and go, I'm going to just kill his policies just because. Just because we're different. Yeah. 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 No. In Salem, that happens constantly. Huh. You know, the, the urban rural divide is intentional. The Democratic Party does what they can to make life worse in the, uh, the rural areas of the state. Yeah. And I'm talking about the Salem Democrats. The Democrats who are over here, they live here. They don't want things to be worse. Right. So they're not sitting there thinking, God, yeah. I really hope my, my guys in Salem make things worse here. Um, but the ones in Salem that get elected and represented, they, <laughs> they do a real number. Yeah. Um, you know, trying to get any change to wolf policy for the last few years has been painful because yeah. there's a lot of money that goes into preventing any uh, improvements to uh, you know, the wolf depredation regulatory environment. Um, you know, Bobby Levy will put in a bill that says, hey, we should uh, compensate farmers better for uh, wolf depredations because when a cow dies, it's not just the cow dying, it's um, the other cows end up getting physically injured and you know, that hurts the flock and that hurts the farmer. That hurts their bottom line, that hurts the community, that hurts our food supply. Yeah, that's right. And uh, if you tell that to a Democrat, they will literally call you a Nazi and that is the end of the conversation. Uh -huh. Now over here, Democrats, like, you know, you'll talk to them and they'll have a different opinion, but they're not going to say you are literally an evil person for it. Yeah. But when you're in that building, they will do that. Huh. <laughs> it's kind of tough. It seems pretty hard to get things done. Oh, yeah. It is hard yeah. to get things done. Yeah. And that's why the Wildcats have been happening in the legislature for the last few years. You know, the, the joke I've been saying is that, you know, the one trick that would get Republicans back in the building is for Democrats to stop forcing them out of the building. Huh. But it's true. They've been told for years, you do not belong here. 
your being here is a courtesy. We don't want any of your bills to pass. So do you think that, I mean, while we're on this topic, do you think that there are times, though, that the Democrats, or excuse me, the Republicans respond equally in a trashy manner? You know what I mean? They're not I mean, allowed to. They yeah, I mean, they're so they're so never right, in a position right, of power right, to do anything right, about and it. So that, but, but, but the point is, is then the spitefulness. Is there, I mean, if you, in that environment, it sounds like, I mean, you just do things out of spite. Yeah. Does that go both directions then? I don't think so. I mean, if you look at a lot of the bills that get passed, overwhelmingly, just about every bill that passes in Salem has 98% of the people in the building voting yes for it. Um, so if you're saying if there was spitefulness, then it would be passing just by the... Yeah, if every, every passed vote would be by a party line, and it's okay, not. Right, just about okay, every bill it. that passes, everybody votes for it. Yeah. Um, there are a few people who have pride themselves on voting no on like everything. Right. That's like there's a little flag that they pass around to each other. Whoever has the, the most no vote tallies for the session, and somebody else will vote no on something. When that guy voted yes, we'll have to move the flag over to his desk. <laughs> um, but for the most part, you know, Republicans are supporting, um, you know, policies that are prioritized by um, Democrats. You know that that their constituents bring. You know, they're not, they're not bad things that are being brought. There are some bad things that they do bring, um, but for the most part, you know, when a, a Democrat says, my constituents need this, Republicans go, great, let's do it. But when a Republican goes, hey, my constituents need this, the response is pretty shocking and painful of like, no, we don't like you, so you're not getting it. So here's, here's something that I kind of realized, when, and this was when I, there were some guys that came over from the West Side, they have a, a podcast called the rational Republican, yep. you know, and I was on their, I was on their podcast. But one of the things that was kind of interesting is when we, because they're very much urban. Both of those dudes yeah. were urban. Okay, and so, so when we started talking about some of those things, like wolves, for instance, they, what I felt, what I, the what I thought might have been, a political divide was really an urban rural divide. I mean, and so they. They just didn't understand. Yeah, I mean because, I mean so they're they're both right leaning. It's a right leaning conversation, but they really didn't understand the complexity of wolves just because they didn't understand the vastness of Eastern yeah. Oregon. You know. Oh yeah. Yeah. Yeah, and there are some good attempts to try and bridge that. Um, you know, uh, Bobby Levy before she got into state legislature, and even now that she's still there, she's part of something called the Eastern Oregon Women's Coalition. Yeah. It does right. a, a, an event called the Eastern Oregon Economic Summit. I think it happens every June. And she actually brings Democratic elected officials from the West Side and goes, right. Right. meet our people, le learn about our issues. And it's been, it's been pretty helpful to try and you know, bring people together. Um, still hasn't been any, any policy movement on the wolf issue, obviously. But you know, just having them here makes them more sympathetic and lets them listen yeah. a little bit more. So there's, there, are, there are attempts to try and bring people together a little bit more. But what it comes down to the end of the day is um, how much money people are getting from certain interest groups to pursue certain policies. Yeah. Um, I think uh, Commissioner Scarfo talked about um, a wolf bill again that happened like last year, and Bobby had an, Bobby Levy had an idea, a representative, and like this would be a good way to work on the wolf issue. And then a guy named David Gomberg, a state representative from the West Side, was like, no, 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 there's no wolves in my district, but I, I'm the one who knows how to solve this problem. You need to have my bill go forward. <laughs> Neither of them went forward, but because he was the Democrat, he at least got some movement on his. He had donations from political groups that don't want there to be any any positive developments on wolf policy. So he is there to insert himself into the situation so that nothing good happens. Yeah. And then because of that, he's going to get more money and the cycle is going to keep repeating. Uh -oh. Now, the best solution would be for people who are affected by wolf policy to start fundraising money and give it to candidates who are supporting it and give it to candidates running against the people who don't want there to be any changes. Mm. You know, you could give Bobby Levy a bunch of money to deal with uh, wolf policy, but because she's in the minority, it's not going to be as effective. But you give um, David Gomberg's next challenger, uh, whoever runs against him, you raise you know, $10,000 and give it to whoever runs against him in a very safe district. He has to raise $20,000 to face that $10,000. Suddenly he goes, whoa, OK, maybe I should step away or try and help because I don't want to have to fundraise as much money every time because of the wolf issue. Yeah, yeah. So it's a disincentive. Yeah. Yeah. There's and a lot of money incentivized to make sure that rural issues go worse. Yeah. 
Well, okay, so let's, I, you and I can talk about this long <laughs> Oh, time. yeah. Let's, let's come back to Elgin, though. You yeah. Know, and, and I would, so, I mean, you had mentioned that in that, James, where you, I mean, you like being able to make a difference locally. And, I mean, talk about that, just how you being involved, you're able to push things along in a positive manner. So the one thing that uh, I like doing that I haven't done in a while, uh, I was actually telling Alex about this yesterday um, in a couple months, a um, couple meetings down the road. I want to get all the different organizations to say, hey, come to my council meeting and, uh, and be there. Tell us what you're doing, you know, the, the Lions Club, the, uh, the, the EDGE group, which is kind of like the Elgin support group, uh, kind of small. They could use some members too, by the way. Reach out to maybe Kathy Bonney, could point you in that direction. But get all these members together, like Stampede Hall and everything. Um, people doing trails for rail stuff um, and just see what everybody's working on you know there might be something common that everybody's working on that we could bring our forces together and work together to make Elgin a better place yeah. and so that's that's what I like to do is try to get our community together um, that's a big big deal for me so well and I think that that's the common thing theme that I've seen as I've been running how is is that there are times that you have really sharp people but they're kind of isolated. They're, you know, these, they're, they're working on different projects and they're not actually putting their heads together to push something forward. Correct, they're not coming together and working together as a team because there a, a, seems to be always a disconnect. Right. And that's that's kind of everywhere, even in, even in law enforcement and different things, I've kind of seen disconnects, you know, where people need to work together. And so that's a big thing for me is to bring folks together to, to accomplish things. Yeah. So. Um, let me ask a question that neither neither one of you knew I was going to ask, and that is, Ooh. the I mean, I spent some time with Scott, Scott, the the county planning division dude, okay, mm -hmm. and the other day, and one of the things we were talking about was, uh, you know, the land that is developable, developable that is able to be developed, like. Like the slope above Cove, okay, there's a bunch of homes up there on Love Road and whatever. That's outside of Cove, Cove limits, city limits. That's county, okay. And so, so, then, so then I said, well, what other areas are there like that? And he showed me some areas out in Elgin that are like that. Do, have you seen, I mean, what's your, what are your, are you guys able to, where are people building? Are they built? If the people that are building out in Elgin, and you know, you would know because you also are a contractor. It's what you do. Yeah. So there's uh, there's urban growth boundaries, and if your land is already in that urban growth boundary, then you could build on it. But there's a lot of rules. Like you have to. Um, I dove into this a little bit, but not much. So I'll answer yeah. this the best I can. Um, like there's there's areas that are buildable when you're in the urban growth boundary. Outside of that, it's not technically buildable without having like a land study done. The other thing would be have that land study done. They come in, they evaluate, okay, how, you know, how much can the infrastructure handle and all that mm -hmm. to, to build on to Elgin. Um, so there is uh, a few chunks of land right now that are, that are buildable that people yeah. could go ahead and build, but the landowner, you know, they got it. They, right. They're well, not selling. I right. want to try to annex in. Yeah. They're not right. selling for that. We right. want to develop yeah. and annex into the city. We also have um, an ordinance on that. Uh, that has to be followed, you know, as far as, you know, sidewalks, how the road's going to go. It basically holds the developer accountable. Um, so if and when there is another subdivision that tries to come forward, we'll, we'll want to make sure we're sticking to all of our policies and rules. So Yeah, and I yeah. guess I guess kind of what where my thought process has been is there's for professionals that come into the area, professionals that have higher-end jobs, physicians and professors and I don't know whoever that is you know a lot of times they they're not wanting to build in the city yeah. in any city they're wanting they're wanting a little bit of a place that has five acres and in the county and that kind of that falls in the county range and there are property and that's that that's a lot of that definition of the property up above Cove those all have minimum five acre lots or whatever the case might be which is just fine for some people that are looking for that kind of home so I don't know. Have any thoughts on any of that? I'm all about city growth uh, yeah. as long as it's done right. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, there there are a couple of opportunities. The north end of town has a has a lot of nice nicer homes going in because um, it was an area that was uh, put together, and you know, there's, there's some nicer homes like the the high school shop class just built a house. Beautiful home. Oh yeah, it's for sale. So if anybody's looking to move to Elgin, <laughs> please 
Um, and then there's, there's one big, big uh, farm field outside of town that can be rezoned and used for um, development. And I, I looked at it with my, my predecessor the other day as I was getting you know, some onboarding and talked about, you know, that, that's, it's a place where the guy will want to sell someday, but he's holding on to it because it's basically his retirement plan. Yeah. Hold on to it until it's at peak value and he's ready to go and, and we can turn it into uh, more housing development. Well, and I, we we keep hearing this thing of like there's a housing shortage, yeah. And so then the more I dig into that, you know, I don't. It's not easy to fix. It's not that there's not opportunity to build. Yeah. It's that maybe financially it doesn't make sense, or you know, the people that move in they want to buy something that's already built. They don't want to build something from scratch. You know. Yeah, well, this is where people are going to say that I'm actually a closet leftist and talk about the, the big problem with the student loan crisis is that people are paying student loans instead of housing loans. Oh, interesting. We can either have a housing market or a student loan crisis. And um, even though I'm a Republican, I'm going to say we should have a housing market rather than a student loan crisis. Mm. So, yeah, everybody shoot me on the comments. <laughs> no, no, hey, hey that's, show, that's good. It's showing you can work together and look exactly. at issues differently. And, and I like that. It's great, Alex. Yeah, definitely. You know, I the I get like you know the idea of you need to work for for something. You don't just want to give a college degree away for free. But uh, my golly, do we want a housing market? Do we want contractors to be able to go to work and build quality homes for people, or do we want people slogging away paying student loans to the federal government until the end of time? Well, and <laughs> right, but but part of the deal, and I was talking to Shauna McKinnis the other day about this, and that is the the market has changed a little bit. Yeah. Okay. So we so. It used to be, Alex, that somebody, and you've just recently been married, a couple of years now. Yeah. yeah, you know. Normally, you know, in the past, you know, young couples move into starter homes. And a yeah. starter home is, they're not always beautiful. They're just, yeah. they're just a place, you know. I mean, it's a starter home. But I think that, you know, younger couples have a higher threshold of what they think is a starter home. Do you agree? <sighs> Maybe. Um, I do. Yeah. I've seen uh, younger couples come in and they buy a pretty nice, fancy house. And um, I'm thinking, man, I paid 47500 bucks for a two-bedroom right. you know, that was run down and needed some love. And I've given it some love. And now it's three-bedroom and beautiful home. And I think that's, uh, that's what we need to go back to. Look for a starter home. Not yeah. something that's already finished. You know? Find something and clean it up and, and get a little equity in it and take pride in it. Yeah, yeah, but I think oh, you yeah. kind of see that yeah. across the board, whatever it might be. I mean, again, when I was when I was young and couple, we bought used cars, you know, and I think that there's, I mean, all of that is it. And I don't, I don't blame. I mean, every generation you hope my kids, you know, my kids make more money than what I ever did and ever will, you know, and so they they have nicer things than what I did when I and. And that, that, that's a good thing. I mean, that's what I really worked for is I really wanted them to, you know, succeed and so on and so forth. But that, I mean, but along with that comes other challenges too. And you, and it's the same thing when it comes to work. I mean, anyhow, I, I'm, I'm getting off on an old person <laughs> rant. Yeah. That's yeah. All right. Well, and yeah. the, the, my, my generation, especially as younger millennials is that like, yeah, a lot of us have these student loan issues, so we can't even save up for a down payment on a house because right. we're paying student loans. And, well, and uh, that's a good. So, know. so, so, what? How? What do you think is the answer to that? I mean, so you are kind of in favor of the of a canceling bailout. student loans, yeah. absolutely, because they owe. Well, a lot of the loans are owed to the federal government. The federal government, but they already paid for it. So, like, what's what's the deal? Yeah, it's done. Why not just? Well, but yeah, but if it's, but so then you're saying there is. There is no cash outlet to balance the books, or there is? Um, well, what we get out of it is an e the, the best, largest economy in the world. It's trillions of dollars ahead right. of most other people. Um, you know, college students themselves, uh, just through the unpaid internship work they do, contribute billions of dollars to the economy for free. It's free labor. You know, when I, when I was at EOU, I interned for University Advancement for a couple years, right. um, you know, going to Salem and, and passing passing laws and getting money into Union County. Um, you know, that's, that's a lot of money, millions of dollars that we worked on getting here that I did for free. So right. um, for me, what balances out is that the economy grows because we are investing in people. Right. Um, 
So how do you, so, so what do you say to those students that, you know, rather than going to college, they became a welder, they bought a truck, they invested in the infrastructure. I mean, and they, they might have as much money that they own in equipment that they're using every day as what somebody does in a school loan. So well, how, how, do you, how do you work out that, that fairness issue? You know, the question is who's paying you? If you're, if you're paying for, if you're, as a plumber, um, you're going and fixing a doctor's broken faucet, um, you know, that, uh, how do I put it? That doctor's only there because he got an investment in him. So now because that doctor has um, the education necessary to make him a rich doctor, he's paying you back. Well, right, but on the but on the, the less doctor end of the scale, you have people they're not well, physicians. Right. Yeah, but there, I mean, there is a problem there too, is that a lot of people go to college and get useless degrees and don't contribute anything to the economy. Right. And that needs to be looked at. Um, I'm not saying like you know everybody should get degrees in 17th century French literature and the plumbers ought to pay for it because that doesn't help anybody. Um, there does need to be a serious realignment of who we're actually putting in college what degrees they're getting. We do need a lot more blue collar workers, a yeah. lot. It's okay to work with your hands. Oh, absolutely, it's you okay should. If you right. can do it, please. Right, but but the inequity part, I mean, and that's where a lot of people get stuck, is, is yeah. that you, know, you have somebody the same age, one of them has equipment debt because of their profession, the other one has college debt because of their profession, okay? Yeah. And, and so then why would we relieve the college debt and not the equipment debt? You know, that's not a question that I have an answer to because okay. I'm not a, I'm not a, I'm not a, a, a great expert on this. Yeah. Um, you know, I, I, my expert is a lot more municipal policy analysis. Yeah. I didn't write my thesis on... Um, <laughs> no, no, it's just... Uh, yeah, but yeah. You know, it, there are answers to these questions, but what yeah. it comes down to me is just the scale of our economy is worth trillions. And it is worth trillions because so many people have gone to college and have these knowledge jobs. We're building the technology that powers the planet. Yeah. Um, and we all benefit from that. We yeah. have a trillion dollar economy because there are so many college educated people here and there are only so many blue collar workers able to um, be able to provide services and make money that way because there are so many college education people here. Yeah. Well, I think we need to have another conversation about this because this is interesting and Gabe well, in the other room is wanting to throw in too. Oh yeah? Yeah, touch, and so, but yeah. I want to touch base yeah. on that equipment part though. Yeah. Yeah. You, you're right. Uh, you know, I bought my first large semi first large piece, you know, like eight years ago or so. And that was pretty rough for a while. You know, um, business bills just piling up and right. paying that large payment over a thousand a month. And uh, but I powered through it, and worked hard and got that got that thing paid off. And now the door's open to buy another piece if I want to, you know, but yeah. um, I'm not looking to expand just because that was so rough. Right. Paying that that first one off. Um, but yeah, you're right. I mean, it is. It's tough for a while on either side of that fence. Yeah, yeah. So, um, and I, I guess the other thing I'd add is that just the scale of the amount of money that college students have to pay, they're never paying them off. Most of the student loans out there, they're not getting paid off. Um, a, tr you know, a, a plumber or a trucker or a contractor, they're going to be able to pay off a lot of these loans they have. Yeah. They're not a million dollars they have to pay back over their lifetime. Correct. Well, and I, and I, I follow that. You know, but even what they're proposing is not going to deal with a million dollars worth of debt. Yeah. I mean, even what they're, I, maybe it's a hundred thousand bucks or something like that. And I guess the, you know, again, we'll just have to talk about this. We'll talk about this different. Yeah, we'll talk <laughs> yeah. about it another time. That so sounds good. Let's, yeah, let's come back to Elgin. Come back to Elgin. Well, it's the jewel of the Blue Mountains, you know. Um, I, we've talked of so many things so far about you know, kind of like rural problems and issues we're having. Um, I don't think it's a, a real secret that Eastern Oregon's economy isn't doing great, hasn't been doing great for a while, and doesn't have a lot of prospects. In Elgin, I found a, a kind of rare optimism that a lot of people think, you know, if we just work hard, we can actually make things better. Mm -hmm. And that's one of the things that I think is going to make Elgin successful in the long run, is that people feel optimistic. Um, you go south to Baker County, most people just seem really depressed about, it. like, yeah, things aren't going to get better, we're just going to kind of waste away until there's not a whole lot left, but here, especially in Elgin, people are like, yeah, we just need to put our minds to it and we can get it done. So You know, the amazing thing about Elgin, I've been there uh, my whole life. Um, that's good and bad, by the way. <laughs> but I love that town. Um, and when something happens, a tragedy strikes or something, the people really come together and work hard in Elgin right. to help those folks. And and I just want to thank all the citizens for, for always doing that for everybody in our community. So th oh, yeah. I thank you for that. Elgin works hard. They really do. Yeah. Well, and I, and I, I mean, like, 
we're going to go to, which is a pitch again for Elgin Opera House this Friday night, Friday, Saturday, two shows on Saturday, Saturday matinee, Saturday night. Big Fish is again, it's that's playing again. And then the last weekend will be next weekend. Anyhow, we're going to Elgin Opera House Big Fish this this Friday night, you know, and I mean, that is, that is an incredible, I mean, that whole operation in the little town of Elgin it's amazing. is just nuts. Yeah. Amazing. Yeah. 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 I love that, the opera house, the shows that go on there and just the, the economic value to the community and people go see a show, stay for dinner, that kind of thing. It's really important. If we didn't have that opera house, it'd be a severe drag on the economy to just... I think it's the number one economic developer for our town is, is that opera house. It's amazing how many people come from all over the place, all oh, over yeah. the world. They, they've had people from everywhere. It's right. just awesome. Yeah, awesome. well, and you didn't, you know, it's not until, it's not until you drive into Elgin and you go to a show and then you come back out and you go, this is in Elgin. I mean, you yeah. know, I, you know, I mean, and so it's... Uh, I mean that's that's phenomenal. Yeah. And so you have and and all of those things that we've talked about that are affect the world or affect the issue or affect the state or whatever the, you know, none of that has anything to do with what they do. I yep. mean, you know, some of, I mean, you know, part of the world could drop off the cliff tomorrow and Elgin Opera House still has the ability to continue doing the things that they're doing. Yeah, and yeah. you know another thing about if you're going to be out at the Opera House to watch the show Take a few minutes. The museum right next door is thriving and doing awesome. Yeah. Oh, yeah. The museum's really grown. Uh, Charlie Horn, he is amazing. He's done so much for that museum. I just want to thank him for that. I mean, it's just it's awesome. So stop in there and see them as well. Well, There's you know, a lot going I've, on out there. Really. I've never been. I've never been in oh, the, yeah. the museum. Yeah, no, yeah. it's really awesome. Yeah, it's free too. So yeah, yeah, yeah. Hop in. Out there and check they it. have a, a an old jail, like an old city jail. It's kind of restored behind it. So you can you know, yeah, take have, your picture behind I have bars. I've seen like, that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah that part is fun. Older generations, like yeah, I spent a few nights in there. <laughs> 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 yeah, well, that's, there's good things there. You know, when I was first telling people on the west side, like, yeah, I just got a job. I'm going to go work in Elgin. I'm like, well, what's in Elgin? I'm like, Wikipedia, look on Google Maps. Like, we've got an award, uh, a, an opera house with award winning productions. I'm like, wait, really? I'm like, yeah, that's awesome. Come <laughs> yeah. see Elgin. <laughs> yeah, no, that's phenomenal. So, yeah. All right. Well, before we quit, tell us the dates again that were, you have a couple of dates that are important coming up, the meet and greet and so on and so forth. What? June 15th will be uh, Riverfest, so come to Elgin for a day of fun. Um, we'll have, you know, Riverfest is put on by, I think, the Lions Club, right? Yeah, yeah. Um, car, show and, car show. And uh, citywide, like, yard sales. Mm -hmm. and, Everything. Uh, there's a fireman's breakfast as well at the fire station, so get out there and support them. They're a yeah. great, great group of volunteers there, great people. So. Yep, and then there will be a ribbon cutting for uh, the Pocket Park leading to the Joseph, Joseph Branch Trail, and uh, a meet and greet with me. Yeah, don't forget the meet come and greet. Come meet Alex. Yeah. <laughs> All righty. Well, thanks, you guys, for thank you. jumping in. Yeah, yeah, thank you. Really appreciate it this morning. Yep. All right, man. Let's do it. Man, I felt like we were, like, this is Rush Limbaugh or, or Lars Larson today instead of AM Live. <laughs> <laughs> His, like, political jargon is, like, going well, through my brain. Yeah it's, a per yeah, it's a perspective that we don't always get. Yeah. Yep. On this day, April 18th, 1865, Confederate General Joseph E. Johnson surrenders to General William T. Sherman in North Carolina. Something major catastrophe happened on this day in 1906. Major catastrophe. 1906. That was the... Over 4,000 people died. The fire in San Francisco. No. Earthquake. Earthquake and Earthquake. fire. Yeah. 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 Destroyed 75% of the city. Yeah. 1906. Wow. 1924, the first crossword puzzle book is published by Simon & Schuster. 1925, the first World's Fair opened in Chicago. 1986, IBM produces the first megabit chip. 1986. And then we'll just go all the way to 2003. This one's kind of interesting to me. Fox News settles a lawsuit with Dominion Voting for $787 million um, with Fox admitting it had defamed Dominion during U.S. 2020 election by broadcasting conspiracy theories. That's a lot of money. That's a lot of money. 
On this day, the number one movie in 1984, Friday the 13th, the final chapter. <laughs> and then the quote comes from Reba McIntyre. To succeed in life, you only need three things. A wishbone, a backbone, and a funny bone. Hmm. One more time. To succeed in life, you only need three things. A wishbone, a backbone, and a funny bone. All righty. We're out. Yeah. You Thank you guys for being with us this morning. Appreciate it, fellas. Yep. Appreciate it. And we'll... Uh, We'll follow up and have a conversation about student loans because that's, Boy. yeah. As long as I can talk about guns, too, because okay, we'll talk about big yeah. guns. Well, yeah, I'll, 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 if we're bringing we guns go. to you, I'll, I'll join. Okay. There we go. Yeah. <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> yeah, there'd be lots of people that would jump in the, gun, the guns. Especially in Elgin. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. yeah, right. All right, hey, thanks, Eastern Oregon. We'll, we'll see you next time.